Namaste, dear learners. And once again, we welcome you to this open classroom of National Institute of Open Schooling. As you can see on the slide, today we are going to talk about one of the courses in biology in the senior secondary syllabus. And the title of the chapter in biology is Principles of Ecology. I'm Shivani, and I've studied ecology. I've studied it at master's level as well. But one of the questions that usually come to the mind of young learners like you is that why should we study ecology? What's the connection between it and me? I live in a house which is constructed by me, my parents, principally by humans. So what's the role of ecology in my life? Let's establish that connection first, that you, I, perhaps everybody around us is connected to ecology. And therefore, we need to learn it a little better. And then we will move to some of the scientific concepts. OK? So to establish that connection, I leave a little thought in your mind with a little question. Have you seen an insect like this in your life ever? Perhaps most of you learners have seen it or seen some insect similar to this. And what's our first reaction? Very often we look at an insect like this, perhaps we don't even notice it, we walk by it. Or if we notice it, you know what kind of reaction we all have on our faces, right? But does it have something to do with you and your life? Do you think it has something to do for this earth? Such small creature whom people like you and me, me don't even pay any attention to, what can it do for us in our earth? See, that's what I said. The first reaction is they have bad reputation. So what do we do with insects? We kill them. Why do we kill them? Because we think they are pests. They bring diseases to us. They eat our food. So they will reduce the food that we are growing. They'll bring things like H1N1, the viral fever, and therefore, you and me, most of us think that if we have to have an insect, then the best form of an insect is the dead form. So kill the bug as soon as you see it. But a lot of other living creatures on this earth do not think like that. Human beings may. Why don't they think like this? They don't because a lot of plants would not be able to reproduce if there are no insects on earth. You have already studied that insects help in pollination, right? So if there were no insects, a large number of plants would not be able to reproduce and some of those plants actually may be our food or some of those plants must be of species from where we get our drugs, our medicines, those plants also won't be there on this earth anymore if there are no insects. In fact, there are number of insects like this one, the praying mantis, which either eat other insects and they help save our food from those little insects which would have eaten the food. So you see, the only good bug is not a dead bug, a live bug is important in your lives, in my life as well. A little riddle. Solve this puzzle. I'm everywhere. I'm also there in your body. I'm all around you. I'm there in water. I'm there in the river. I'm also there in the soil. So guess, who am I? You've guessed it, right? Isn't it a very common riddle? Yeah, you got it. They are the highly, highly tiny, small organisms which we know as microbes. What do these microbes do on this earth? Why should we care about them? Well, a lot of things that you cannot imagine actually is what ecology brings to us. You know, you would not get you or rather your parents because you, I hope and I am sure that you perhaps do not have diabetes, but people who have diabetes would not get their medicine if there were no bacteria on this earth. The medicines are produced by using some of these bacteria. You and I may not be able to eat the dal as we call it, all the pulses that we eat, 
if there were no microorganisms on this earth. Because the nitrogen that arhar dal, chana dal, other pulses contain, they are able to get it from the soil only because there are small little creatures in the soil which bring the nitrogen from the air to the soil so that these plants can absorb it in our farmlands. Right? So I have a list of a lot of these things that insects or small little micro, microorganisms do for you and me. Now every time you are at your dining table, you are eating your fo uh, food, do remember there is some little bacteria that helped in ensuring that your food was healthy and your food had right amount of nitrogen and protein in it. The last connection again that I want to show with you. Any living being has an end. So living beings do die. What you are seeing right in front of you is a whole herd of vultures who have got killed. If there were no microorganisms on this earth and when you and I would die, many other plants would die, animals would die, such birds would die, they would continue to remain like this in their dead forms for ages and ages. The earth would become a heap of dead bodies of a large variety of organisms. It would not get cleaned if there were no microbes. Because it's the microorganisms which eat the dead bodies and ensure that they go back to the soil, the dead remains go back to the soil and our earth remains clean. I talked about very small little things to you and you would again say, I don't get to see these things. How can I find this connection? Now I'm talking to you about a very big animal that you know, which is also our national animal and we take a lot of pride in it and that's the tiger. Usually a lot of question that comes to me as an environmentalist and an ecologist is, if we need to save the tigers, it's fine. But why should I save the grass? Why should I save the kanha grassland, the grassland in kanha? I will just save the tigers. But learners, remember, there is a deep connection between the grass and the tiger. If we need to save the tiger, we only need to ensure that the grasslands are saved. The tigers will be saved automatically. Because even when the tiger doesn't eat the grass, the tiger eats the herbivores which in turn eat the grass. So you see, this is what ecology is about. It's about connections and interconnectedness. Have you begun to see the connection between ecology and your lives? Really, there are deep relationships, as I said. And it is these relationships which keep us alive on this earth. So trust me, if there were no insects, if there were no bacteria and viruses, if there was no grass, even when we don't eat the grass, eat the grass in the grassland directly, although we eat wheat and rice, we would not be able to survive. So learners, can you now see a very clear connection why we need ecology around us? And if we need to save the natural resources around us, we need to understand what goes on in these natural systems. And that's the reason NIOS brings this chapter to you, which is about principles of ecology. Simply put, you know, the word ecology itself originally is not a part of English dictionary. It's come today. It, it has come today because it has been used very commonly as part of spoken English and written English. But ecology, if I need to explain to you, which is also given in your textbooks, is the study of life. It comes from two Greek words, oikio and logos. Oikio is life and logos is study. So study of life around me is ecology. A lot of time, dear learners, when we say study of life around me, I forget myself. And perhaps that's the reason that a lot of natural resources today need a lot of attention or they are being degraded. Because I feel as a human being that I'm supreme or I'm out of the loop of ecology. But the minute I see myself as a part of it, Ecology comes so naturally to me and I start understanding things around me much better. So remember, ecology is the study of 
me and life around me and my connections with life around me. Okay. Now, there are two important words that we need to understand play a great amount of role in nature. And you know what these words, words are? You can see the, the gecko, the house lizard eating on that insect there. And that's a kind of interaction. So there are n number of interactions very commonly happening around us all the time in nature. And when I say nature, we don't need to go to the forest to see these interactions. The picture that I have put up for you there is very much shot in my own house. So aren't there these interactions happening along me in all the time? Have you ever seen a gecko eating a lizard? Have you seen a mosquito biting you? Are these not interactions? These are definitely the interactions that go around in nature around us. And it's these interactions which start connecting things. It start connecting the water that flows out of my tap to me. Because ultimately that water is likely to come from a river. The river perhaps that flows by your city, by your town or by your village. Or it comes from the water that has got stored naturally in the ground where you live, which is called underground water. That water also comes from the rain, isn't it? So there are interactions and there are interconnectedness. Once we understand these two words, it's very easy to understand ecology. But this is like the backbone, as we say, the backbone of ecology, these two words. Because there is interactions and there are interconnectedness, there are implications of it. And one implication is that if I do one thing in nature, I may think I have just done one thing. So I go out into say um, uh, a little forest, I'm taking a walk there. Or for that matter, I go out into the garden of my own house. And I see that there's a weed there. Weed, you know, we say na, unwanted plant. This is not wanted. It's not looking good. I don't need it in my garden. And I pluck it from the soil. And I throw it away. And my morning ends there. And I think I have done only one thing. But no, that's where we are wrong. Because there are a lot of things that that little plant which seemed to have been unwanted by you or me in our gardens, was actually doing in nature. So I have unplanted it, I have uprooted it, and I think over. No dear, that's where ecology begins, because I walk back into my house, but maybe there were lots of things that has got undone, or new things that have got done because of this one action. I uprooted the plant, threw it. But maybe the plant was binding some soil. That soil has become loose and maybe it will get dry faster. The water will get evaporate. That could be one implication, second implication of it. There could be one more implication that maybe there were little bacteria in the soil which were attached to the root of the plant. Now I've uprooted it. So those bacteria may not be attached and they may not be getting their food. They may get killed. And such predictions can go on. There are so many things that may happen by one action of mine, which was just uprooting the plant. So, and that's where this law of ecology is important, that we can never do any one thing in nature because everything is connected. Okay, let's move on. Fine, we've understood that ecology is connected to us, ecology is connected to the learners, ecology is connected to all the human beings on this earth. And now you're convinced that I, you want to study it. Like any other science, we also need to classify and have steps of studying any scientific process. Similarly, in ecology, we have created a number, we as in the scientist in a standard manner on this, in this world, have created a way to study science. And there are many levels. What are these levels in ecology? If I talk of the topmost level, that's ecosystem. I will come to each of these. What do these terms mean? Just below the ecosystem is community. As I come down the staircase, after community, I, found pop I find population. And after population, I find species. From species, we get individuals. So we are homo sapiens, the species. 
you are an individual, I am an individual. And then there are cells in my body. So there are cells and there are individuals, many individuals who look similar form species, many species who live together, many number of individuals in a species form the population. Like most scientific studies, ecology also needs a little scientific framework to be studied, right? Now we are convinced that tiger is connected to us, therefore the grass is connected to us, the insect is connected to us and we are ready to study ecology. Uh, where do we start? In a very standard manner, there are levels of study that have been framed in a standard manner on in this world for ecology. Let's look at what these levels are. The topmost level, so if I'm standing on a staircase and I look from the top, the ecology staircase looks like I'm on top, so that's the ecosystem level. I'll explain each of the levels to you. Then I come to the next step, which is community. Step after that is population. After that, I find species. And when I probe a species like Homo sapiens, I will find myself an individual there. And if I probe the individual, I will find n number of cells in my body. So it's the cells, the individuals, the species, population, community, and on the top, there are ecosystems. What do we do and how do we study them? Let's begin, let's start climbing the stairs. So we will begin at the first step. The first step, as I said, learners, is that of organisms. There are individual organisms. So you are one of the organism. I am one of the organism. There are huge number of such organisms on this earth. You've already studied in your earlier science lessons that we have organisms which can't even be looked through naked eye. We need a microscope to look at them. We were talking about a bacteria recently, right? Now, bacteria is not visible to naked eye. So there are very minute organisms, say like the bacteria, the virus, the amoeba, the paramecium, for whom we need a microscope to see. Two huge mammoth giant ones, we come somewhere in between, but then you also have the elephant and you have the whale sharks and you have the, the whales themselves. So that's all of them are organisms. That's the first level at which I can study ecology. So I can study, you can study me as Shivani and life around me. That becomes studying ecology at an organism level. What comes next? The next level is species. So what scientists have tried to do is that once they have found that a number of organisms look similar, they behave similar, they eat similar kind of food, they are found more or less in similar areas, so say in oceans, different, different oceans of the world or different forests of the world or deserts of the world, then they try to club them into a larger group which is called species. But a very essential characteristic of a species is that two organisms of the same species should be able to come together, breed and reproduce and produce a baby which is viable, which can live on its own, right? So even when the tiger and the lion, at times when you see, you may find, oh, they look similar, they eat similar kind of food, but dear, they belong to two different species because a male tiger and a female lioness or a male lion and a female tigress can't come together, breed and produce a viable offspring. Even if they happen to produce a baby, the baby won't be able to live naturally in the world. And therefore, they belong to two different species. So you need to remember that a group of organisms can be called species only if they can come together, breed and produce a young baby which can survive in nature by its own. Okay. Now what next? So many animals of one species, when they live together at a given time and in a given place, they are called population. So population of tiger in India is different from population of tiger in Siberia. Why? Now because they are both the same species, but they are living in different locations. So therefore, it will be called the, the population of tiger in India and the population of tiger in Siberia. But if we, all, if we count all the tigers in this world together, then we will say the global population of 
tigers. Therefore, the location where organisms of a species are looking are very important to find out population. And therefore, population of your district and population of the district that I come from could be different. Can you try to find out population of your own district? And I mean human population. I don't mean the population of tigers, right? What comes next? Next is, I said human population and tiger population. Well, tigers and humans usually don't share uh, natural habitats. We don't live together. But we do share our habitats with dogs, right? So it could be that in your area or in your residential society, there is population of human beings, which would be all the number of people living in your society. But at the same time, there may be a pack of dogs who are living also wild dogs, not, not pet, stray dogs as we call them, living in your society. Now all the dogs of your society will also form a population. But when human population and dog population are seen together as part of a larger area, then it becomes a community. It becomes a community of living organisms. So population has only one species. It will have either humans or tigers or dogs or, or neem trees or mango trees. But communities will have all these population living together sharing non-living resources around them, like the dogs would share water with us, they would share the food with us, they would share, share the soil, as mean they also live, they share that with us, and they interact with us. So sharing of all the resources and interaction between different populations living together as part of a defined system at a given time is called community. Clear? But community has only living organisms. Remember, community will have trees and insects and bacteria and plants and dogs and you and me in it. But the minute we go to the next level, which is the ecosystem level, remember the topmost level, then we also bring in non-living part in it. So when we say the ecosystem of the Aravali Hills, for example, now I'm taking just the example, it will not just have say the deer that may be living there or maybe the leopards that may be living there or some human beings also who are living there. It will have all of those living species and populations but at the same time the ecosystem of Aravalis will also include the soil, will include the grass, the waterfalls or the rivers that may be coming out of Aravalis. As the minute we add non-living components to community, it becomes ecosystem. And that's the highest level that we can study ecology at. And I again bring back two important words that I began my talk with, which is interactions and interconnectedness. They are all dependent. I am dependent on the river that flows by my village, but the, will, the river is also dependent on me. If I build a dam, the river cycle gets killed, isn't it? So that kind of interdependence, interaction, and interconnectedness is what is the basis of ecology. I hope so far so clear because we have covered almost four subtopics of the chapter that you are dealing with and we have reached, we have finished the levels of uh, organization in nature which is there in your book. Now what I have for you, I, 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 I just kind of put the slide back. I have a real life story. I repeat, I have a real life story, it actually happened in this world to show you how interconnections and interdependence is important in ecology and why it is important that learners like you or human beings like me understand ecology. What can it do to us? Why do we really need to, re and that's why I'm saying it's a real life case study, which I've converted into a sto story. It's a real life incident and I'll read this story that I've created for you. A few years ago, say maybe 10, 20, maybe 30 years, we can go back at that time. There was a health service department. We all have health services department. So we have the civil health service department or the hospitals. So there was a city, like there is a municipal corporation which has health service department. There was this city called, which I have called Gyanpur in my study. They are Gyani people. So we had Gyanpur. And Gyanpur had like their municipal corporation and their health service. They realized that, that there were too many mosquitoes and therefore 
malaria was spreading in their city, which was Gyanpur. So the wise people of Gyanpur and the wise corporation of Gyanpur city decided to kill the mosquitoes. That's what we do with the bug. So they sprayed DDT. We know that DDT, when you spray on, on the grasses, the open areas, the water bodies, they kill the mosquitoes. And that's exactly what happened. The mosquitoes got killed. So malaria would have gone, hopefully. Let's see what happened next. Now what happened? The city or that little village had a pond nearby it. Now the mosquitoes died. But these mosquitoes, remember, is also somebody's food. They were being eaten by the fishes. The fishes start eating mosquitoes and therefore they also started eating DDT. What would DDT do to the fishes? Well, the fishes become very slow. It started affecting, like if we get poison in our body, we also go slow, we may even get killed. So lizards also became very slow. When lizards were slow, it became very easy for the cats to catch the lizard because lizards were their food. So the cats were eating a lot of lizard because lizards were easily available. They were not running away. Too much food is available. So too many cats came to Gyanpur. Because there were too many cats in the Gyanpur, suddenly now they realized the Gyanpur people, because they were living in village, they realized that they had the top of their roofs or the huts which were made out of grasses. That suddenly the roof of their houses were getting eaten away. And when they started probing around, they realized they were caterpillars, small little caterpillars which suddenly grew in number and they were eating away the roofs of their houses. You imagine you are sitting in your house and suddenly the roof goes away or there are holes happening in the roof. How would you feel? But that happened in Gyanpur. And then they realized that these caterpillars were actually being eaten by lizards. But too many cats came and all the lizards got eaten away. When there were no lizards, the caterpillars started growing because nobody was eating them. Too many caterpillars, their roofs were gone. Well, the situation became so critical that there were, now the cats which were eating the lizards started dying because you remember the fishes, the DDT was in water, it came to the fishes, the fishes were eaten by cats, the cats also got poison, they started getting killed. When they started dying, too many rats came in. The whole area of Gyanpur had just too many rats. And when the rats come in, well, there was a new danger of plague. You know, na? plague is, is, is an infection that we get from rats. They are also mammals. We are also mammals. Now, malaria was off their minds and suddenly came the danger, plague will come in. What do we do? Well, learners, what had to be done? The actually more cats were parachuted in Gyanpur. They were from the aeroplanes, the cats were dropped in Gyanpur and there were literally cats parachuting happening there. Do you realize the connection now? We thought we had just killed the mosquito by spraying the DDT. We killed mal malaria by spraying DDT. But you see a whole lot of series of things and interactions happened in nature and brought back to a state where we thought we were going to get died of plague and we needed more cats. And I have brought this slide back to show you that there is this constant connection in various levels of organization in nature. And if we don't understand this connection, then there is problem because then we start saying that, oh, I have only taken care of malaria. And then I realized, no, I may have killed malaria, but I have brought plague, which is even more dangerous. So what we do now is we look at more interactions that will take place during ecological processes in nature, but we'll do in part two of our lesson. For now, you sit back, move around, and as you go out of the rooms, do start observing nature, do start observing things around you, how you interact with them, and how they interact with you. There can be a little lizard in your house eating the insect or there could be some cats parachuting actually happening in this world at some point in time in little corner of this earth. So take care, be good and we'll come back with part two of this lesson very soon. Thank you.